In Chapter 3 of the Sounds of Nightmares podcast, Noon visits the shopping mall, a grand complex as massive as it is strangely empty. This is actually my favorite dream that Noon recounts to Otto during the series, for not only is it quite eerie and unsettling in a way the others are not, it's also highly detailed and expands our understanding of the world of nowhere in ways that perhaps we didn't expect. I assume if you're here then you've already listened to Chapter 3, but if not, I would highly recommend doing that first, as this video will contain spoilers for the episode and for all of the Little Nightmares games as well. Let's start with a brief overview of the dream itself. When Noon falls asleep and crosses over the misty threshold, she feels a hand in the darkness suddenly let go of her own. She then opens her eyes to find herself in a huge but empty parking lot, its painted lines stretching all the way to the horizon under a sunless sky. The vast expanse is filled only with silence, a silence so heavy that Noon describes her heartbeat sounding like a marching drum in comparison. The sensation is followed by a loneliness so profound as to be nearly unbearable, and so she turns away, only then noticing the giant shopping mall standing behind her. Excited by the prospect of shopping, she runs through the open doors and into the promenade, its lights flickering on one by one as though greeting her. To Noon's disappointment, most of the shops appear to be closed with no visible doors or displays, but a voice over the PA system shortly directs her to Jujubee's Toys, a colorful store filled with all manner of exciting playthings. The toys on the very first shelf appear quite old, but as Noon wanders deeper through the impossibly long aisles, the selection changes. At length, she is surprised to find the same toys she had back home, as well as others she had only wished for, like the little doll Lottie, though Noon is quick to notice that the color of its eyes and skin isn't quite right. She chooses one anyways and plays with it for a few minutes before growing bored, and as if in response, the doll suddenly becomes wet with a thick, dark liquid. Noon steps away momentarily to grab a jewelry-making kit featuring a pretty red necklace, but when she returns with the box, Lottie is gone and the shelves are all empty. Confused, Noon puts it down on the floor, and the lights go out as the store abruptly closes. She exits out the front and makes her way up to the next floor, finding a bijouterie, or jewelry store, open and inviting, with a magnificent glass case at the center holding the same red pendant that had drawn her eye in the toy store. She takes it, and a clothing rack rolls out to her with dresses exactly her size, including the same one she had worn her first day at the copy. Before she gets a chance to pick any, however, the lights go dark as the store suddenly closes, and a new voice on the PA system directs her to a theater up on the third floor. Noon climbs the next set of stairs to find a magnificent red lobby with two huge golden doors at the far end, and after grabbing a bucket of popcorn from atop the concessions counter, she pushes her way through them. Rows and rows of velvet seats await her within, seemingly occupied, and Noon quietly makes her way down the aisle to an empty seat in the very center. The film begins, and to Noon's surprise, it is one she has seen countless times before, except this time it is all wrong, with scenes out of order and details twisted in strange ways. She begins to feel out of place, and, just as she realizes that the rest of the seats are actually filled with mannequins and not other people, the salty smell of the ocean enters her dream. She spies the ferryman sitting just a few seats over, and hears him say only this. The faraway drifts near. Tread long, then sink deep. Two flows from one, and here is whole again. Then, as suddenly as he had appeared, the ferryman vanishes. The film projector starts flickering, and Noon runs up to find the door to the projection booth ajar. A voice booms out of the PA speakers, warning her not to enter, but she pushes hard on the door anyways and throws it open to reveal a mass of pumping flesh on the floor and a deformed eye acting as the projector. Addressing her by name, the creature within asks Noon if she is going to leave, and when she says yes, it desperately offers to give her anything she desires. But she doesn't want anything from it, and so the pulsing worsens until the very walls themselves start throbbing sickly around her. Noon wastes no time running out of the theater, down the stairs and back onto the promenade, lights flashing dizzyingly overhead and the PA screeching. Dark liquid begins spilling out of the walls, pooling around her feet, and Noon looks up to see the ferryman on the floor above, pointing at her chest at the red pendant still hanging around her neck. She casts it down at her feet, and then everything fades away. There's a lot to process here, but let's start with the fact that the shopping mall appears to be a similar entity to the signal tower. It is evidently a living structure composed of flesh and eyes, and the way it starts to collapse at the end of the dream is similar to how the signal tower comes apart after Six is freed by Mono. What's more, the shopping mall can see directly into Noon's mind and is privy to her memories, not just her general mental state, and shows her past, present, and future through the toys at the toy store. 
Very old toys, the same toys that Noon had back home, and others she wanted but never received. Forgive the tangent, but this is quite similar to the way the signal tower shows Six, her past, present, and future through the portraits in her safe room, depending on how we interpret them, at least. The one on the right is obviously Six pre-transformation, and the one in the center depicts a girl in a yellow dress, the same one seen in the ladies' quarters of the Maw. While her identity has never been confirmed, a popular theory suggests that she is the braid girl from Very Little Nightmares, and this works quite well as a representation of Six's present. For just as this girl died at the end of Very Little Nightmares, hence the scratched out eyes, her portrait here represents the death of Six's innocence, her childlike self. Following her time in the Signal Tower, Six is changed. Cold, indifferent, willing to drop Mono, leave other kids on the Maw to die, devour the runaway kid, consume the lady, and slaughter a room full of guests without a second thought. An alternative explanation is that this girl might be the Lady of the Maw as a child, and the portrait is instead showing Six's near future when she will depose the Lady and steal her dark power. While this would leave the present conspicuously unaccounted for on the wall, there are portraits of Monster Six elsewhere in the tower that could be considered her present state. As for the final portrait on the left, this might be representing Six's far future, perhaps as a granny-like creature to wallow in the watery depths of the Maw or somewhere else altogether. Anyways, all that is to say that the Signal Tower and Shopping Mall share some interesting parallels with each other. In my analysis of Nowhere Theory, which explores the possibility that every location in Nowhere is based on a specific need in Maslow's hierarchy of needs, I said that the Shopping Mall, like the Signal Tower, doesn't quite fit into the hierarchy and might represent consumerism, a more abstract need in the same vein as escapism. I think materialism is actually a better term here, as the core idea is that both of these pursuits stem from a desire to fill the void, the dark emptiness within yourself when your physical and psychological needs are not being met. But there are a few immediate issues with this. First, where is the excess? Since nowhere takes every need to an extreme, you would expect to see toys spilling off the shelves in the toy store, not placed neatly upon them. The buckets of popcorn waiting outside the theater are said to be overflowing, but that's kinda how they are in the real world too, so I'm not sure that counts for much. Second, where are the residents? Every flesh entity is seen to feed off the residents of nowhere, serving and then consuming them, but the mall is completely empty and still. Noon does see shadows behind the glass of some shops, but considering the parking lot is also totally empty, I think this is probably just flesh pulsing behind them. To make sense of these odd discrepancies, we must return to that fundamental purpose behind these structures. To meet a need, to offer an experience so powerful and compelling that residents are irresistibly drawn as moths to a flame. The signal tower offers an escape from all your troubles, the prison offers maximum security from the dangers of chaos, and the maw offers food, an endless cascade of fresh, or maybe not so fresh, meat. What does the shopping mall directly offer to noon? Whatever you desire, it's yours. It offers her anything she wants, but just like the crackly voices over the PA system, this promise rings hollow, empty. It offers everything, but also nothing. And I think that is the key. I believe the reason for the shopping mall's odd appearance and behavior is that it lost its keeper, the human vessel for its power, and as a result is only a shell of its former self. What's more, we might already know precisely who this individual was. The organist. An important detail I skipped over earlier is that, right after Noon enters the theater, a spotlight hits the stage illuminating an organ, but there is no organ player in sight. After a brief pause, the film then begins, with Noon specifically noting the absence of any adverts or introductions beforehand, things that probably would have been provided by this missing performer. At one point this place was like the Maw, Prison, and Signal Tower, filled with residents and brimming with excess goods, all overseen by the organist at their place in the grand showroom. But then, the cycle was broken. In my cycles theory, I tentatively suggested that maybe all the cycles of nowhere are linked in some way, and if such a thing were true, the shopping mall might have been cut off from the greater network when this disaster occurred. Alternatively, even if the cycles are not all connected, the creatures themselves might be able to communicate with each other as a sort of hive mind. I've always wondered how those aboard the Maw communicate with the rest of nowhere, like the Pale City. Clearly the teacher and Barber are known by the lady somehow, but seeing how the postal service doesn't seem to be functioning all that well and no TVs can be found in the lady's residence, it would make sense at some level for information to be passed directly between the signal tower and Maw. 
Perhaps when the shopping mall failed, it was rejected by the others and severed from this connection. Either way, this would explain why the entity is so intensely lonely, radiating that agony beyond its physical boundaries into the parking lot beyond. Additionally, when Noon sees the creature's true form, she says, I felt bad for it. Or well, them. This place had been warped by pain and wanted so badly to keep me. And then when she runs away, it shrieks after her. Everyone needs someone. Don't leave me alone. So why exactly do these entities need human vessels to function anyways? While we don't know for sure, there are a few hints throughout this dream. For starters, it is implied that these eldritch beings cannot truly understand humans without an intermediary and can only imitate what they see. Noon makes this observation when she opens the projection booth to find countless film reels scattered within. It was so alone. It took to imitating. But these imitation films are twisted, wrong, and the one meant for Noon isn't able to hold her attention for very long. It could be that without an authentic human touch, the shopping mall just isn't convincing enough to draw in any prey. A second detail I think is important is that the creature also seems to be at odds with itself, with multiple voices that all have different ideas and often argue with each other. This legion of consciousness makes a lot of sense considering what we know about the signal tower, how it is a conglomeration of countless residents, countless minds, and the shopping mall might be made of the same. Perhaps the human keeper acts as a unifying force that brings all those voices together, and there is some evidence for this, albeit in a different context. Before starting their session in this episode, Otto explains that he wants to try depth analysis with Noon and instructs her to bring together the divided parts of herself in order to reveal her inner face. Considering these important functions, it is no surprise that the shopping mall is desperate to find a replacement keeper, and so it repeatedly shows Noon that it wants to join with her, not devour her. In the toy store, she observes that most of the games there are meant for two, and in response, a staticky whisper says, I'll play with you. And when Noon sits in the theater, she says that the chair seemed to hug me. But despite its best efforts, the creature is caught in a loop of failure because it doesn't know exactly what to offer, what it is that humans crave, and making matters worse is the fact that it is also extremely weak. We see that the mall is only able to support one open attraction at a time, and not for very long either. As soon as Noon starts to lose interest in the toy store dolls, they disappear, and the store quickly closes. This enables the bijouterie to open on the next level, but again, when Noon doesn't immediately pick a dress from the rack, it closes. She is then led to the theater on the next level, where the entity tries to run the show on its own, but this doesn't last long before Noon pushes her way into the projection room against its wishes, and shortly thereafter, everything starts coming apart. This acute vulnerability makes a lot of sense, as we see how quickly the signal tower starts falling apart during the hiatus between keepers. Assuming that it was using Six as a temporary host following Mono's defeat of the Thin Man, meaning it must take everything the shopping mall has to hold itself together without a keeper of its own. While I think this theory goes a long way toward explaining the strange state of the mall, it does leave a number of important questions unanswered. First and foremost, how was the cycle broken? Unfortunately, we have very little to go off of here. Maybe it squeezed too tightly? Back in the copy, Noon drops and breaks the small mirror she is holding because Otto is squeezing her, and we see that at least one of the voices of the shopping mall has a tendency to overdo it, so maybe these details are hinting that it pushed its keeper too far somehow? Another good question would be, why are children still dreaming of this location and visiting it if it no longer addresses any specific need? Again, I don't have much of an answer for this, but it might have something to do with the creature's loneliness. We know that Noon herself is very lonely, separated as she is from her parents and from other children, so it could be that she dreamt of the shopping mall not because it had something to offer her, but simply because she could relate to it. Finally, why did Noon need to take off the red pendant she obtained from the bijouterie? Taking it off at the ferryman's prompting is what ends the dream, but why? At first I thought that maybe keeping an item would prevent her from leaving, but we learned that other children had taken things and left, so it doesn't seem like the shopping mall can control them even if they accept its gifts. Maybe their purpose is not to snare the children directly, but rather to convince them to stay, and Noon's discarding of the pendant severed any meager influence the mall might have had over her. Speaking of the ferryman though, this final encounter in the dream should feel very familiar, because we have seen it before. 
In the first issue of the Little Nightmares print comics, we learn the tale of the North Wind, in which a young brother and sister are pursued across the countryside by this dangerous titular entity. Eventually, it corners them at a barn and, after revealing that the sister had been dead for a long time, prepares to claim the boy as well. But before it can do so, the ferryman suddenly appears, offering his hand to the child and snatching him out of the North Wind's clutches. Here in the shopping mall, the ferryman likewise appears to save Noon, helping her end the dream at the last moment. Earlier, the flesh entity had told Noon, So many, they take what they want and go, or get snatched away or worse. And as the dream ends, it pleads to the ferryman, Don't take her. Not this one, too. This feels like a very intentional parallel, the ferryman saving children from a monster of nowhere by offering them his hand, and you could even say this happens with the mirror monster as well. So why does he do this? I have several theories. Regarding the shopping mall, perhaps it can no longer be trusted. If it really had pushed its former keeper to the breaking point somehow, then maybe the ferryman considers it a failure and not worth allocating any more children to. As for the North Wind, I'm wondering if perhaps this entity went rogue, selfishly taking children for itself and not offering them up to the eyes to be used for the perpetuation of the greater cycles. Yet another explanation is that the ferryman simply does this to build trust with the children, encouraging them to cross the threshold when the time comes. But of course, that's just a theory, as is everything else in this video, and I'm really interested to know what you guys think. Could the shopping mall be an eye that fell from its twinkling place in the heavens of nowhere? Or is it something else entirely? Don't forget to leave a like if you enjoyed the video, and be sure to subscribe if you'd like to see more theories on the podcast and Little Nightmares 3. Thank you so much for watching, and I hope to see you in the next one.